we go? We're going. All right. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Yeah, woo, yeah, 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 understandable, too early for that. Look, it is great to see so many people here at the Better Futures Forum 2022. Uh, we're all here, I'm going to sound a little bit like Albo here, we're all here in the spirit of collaboration and community, we're all here to come together to work with the new government. Uh, basically, what we know in this room is the opportunities are real and we're here to work with the new government to let them know these opportunities are real and we're here to make Australia a global leader in all things super duper clean energy. My name is Dan Illich and this is Dan Borsha. We are D1 and D2, uh, if you like. Uh, we are the MCs for the next two days. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, D1? Well, I think I might be, that we've got to get cracking. Yeah, wait, no, yeah, exactly. Time. And too many jokes, yeah. Um, <laughs> We're coming to you live from the Ngunnawal and Nambri country. As we gather from all over Australia, we encourage our online audience to join us in the chat. Uh, no matter where you are, you can join us in the chat and also ask questions along the way as well. Yeah, and we're very much looking forward shortly to having Aunty Dr Matilda House and Amber Yelda welcoming us here. There was a, a scheduling clash, but she's going to be here along with Paul House, her son, to welcome us officially very soon. I want to pay a particular tribute to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in the room and those that are joining us online right around the country, uh, because, of course, maintaining and caring for country has been something that's happened in First Nations communities for tens of thousands of years. The rest of the country is now really catching up and we're having that uh, next part of this conversation now. Uh, before we get underway, we have got some housekeeping matters to go through. For those that are joining us online, good to have you here. To ensure you've got the best experience today, we suggest reading through the help desk located in the tabs on the left-hand side of your screen. That's in the virtual lobby. If you need to contact the wonderful events team or tech support, you can go to your inbox at the top of the screen and search for event support for that instant chat. There will be sections of this program where the events team will push you into different virtual rooms for different components of the conversation, and there will be times we'll be asked to click into the breakout room of your choice via the virtual lobby. Now, if in doubt, just navigate back to the virtual lobby and simply click into your next section. And with so many people joining us from right around Australia, it's really important to keep the program running on time. That's going to be Dan and my job. Uh, well, we're going to try and do that across the two days. Uh, so do pay attention to any of those push notifications and information that comes through uh, throughout the days. Great. And for folks in the room, uh, toilets are uh, out, back out to the lobby, down the corridor, to your right as you exit the auditorium. Do keep in mind there is another event happening uh, in this venue. I think it's a, a, a lecture on ethics. So a few people in camera need to go that one, um, but um, that's, it's also OK. Uh, emergency exits are on my left to your right and out to the foyer. Catering will be provided throughout the day. We ask you not to bring any food or drink into the foyer, so please leave it in the auditorium. Bottled water is OK. Later in the day, we'll be changing venues for our workshops. There are going to be detailed instructions provided to how to get to those. I got lost earlier this morning. I saw a few of them already. <laughs> also, there's going to be a photographer and videographer around the place who's going to be documenting the, the, the next two days. If you don't want to be in any footage uh, or, or have your photo taken, please let organisers know. Uh, now, for COVID-19, in line with current ACT government recommendations, Better Futures uh, Forum recommends face masks be worn whilst attending the forum to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in our community. If you're feeling unwell or need need support at any stage throughout the event, please look for the BFF team. They're going to be wearing blue badges. They can provide you with a rack test if needed. Yeah, and, and of course, we uh, noticed that some people are wearing masks. Please wear those if, if you feel comfortable uh, while we're in this space. And as I mentioned, we are expecting Arnie, Dr Matilda House, uh, to arrive very shortly, and we'll bring you her for that welcome when, in fact, she does arrive here this morning. Yeah, and this forum has been many months in the making. Uh, I hosted last year's online from my bedroom. This is much <laughs> more exciting for me. Uh, I can't go any further without paying special mention to the forum partners who help make this possible. UNSW Canberra and Hester Super. Are there logos there? Oh, yes, there's a few logos around. Well done to them. Thank you, our sponsors. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Thanks for helping this event happen. 
Yeah, because of course events like this don't happen without sponsorship and those important partners. Now during the forum we're going to have the chance to listen and to interact with leading climate champions, covering everything from policy advocacy, health professionals, local councillors, right through to the business sector and a number of politicians as well. We'll also have an amazing row of speakers and session hosts and there are 75 of those wow. in all. So there's a lot <laughs> going to be happening in the next, next two days. Make sure that you familiarise yourself with the program by either navigating to the program tab on the virtual lobby or scanning one of the QR codes posted around the venue, which are also on the back of your name badge. You can get straight to that uh, QR code there as uh, shown by <laughs> Dan One here. Now, we understand that you might have some commitments, which mean that you need to watch the session after it's conducted. All of these sessions are going to be recorded and they'll be available after the live broadcast. So you'll be able to re-watch at a later stage and reflect upon that as well. The program is going to kick off this morning with keynote speeches from global and national leaders with discussions centred on how we can work together with the new government cutting emissions to create a better future for all Australians. All right, I would now like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Since, since 2014, Andrew Barr has been on a mission to make the ACT cool again, and he's done it. <laughs> the ACT is probably the most progressive place in Australia. Since becoming Chief Minister, Canberra has been ranked by the Lonely Planet as one of the best cities in the world to visit. Well, we all knew that. And by the OECD as one of the best cities in the world to live, I think is the reason why I've spent several weekends this year in Canberra looking for real estate. Uh, <laughs> Thanks to record low unemployment, Andrew is also the ACT Treasurer, Minister for Climate Action, Minister for Economic Development and Minister for Tourism, all jobs he acquired through a very transparent and democratic process. <laughs> there you go. Please welcome Chief Minister Andrew Barr. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Dan, for that kind introduction and for stealing my opening joke, but <laughs> never mind, never mind. I'd like to acknowledge traditional custodians of the land in which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us today. Thank you very much for the invite to say a few words at the beginning of this uh, important two-day forum. It is an opportunity uh, for me uh, across many of my portfolios uh, to outline how the ACT government is driving climate action uh, in our territory and how we are seeking to be a national and international leader. We have committed uh, to one of the most ambitious climate action agendas in the world. As a small jurisdiction, I think we're very well placed to demonstrate that you can deliver on an ambitious agenda in a way that supports economic prosperity uh, and a strong budget position. Once a treasurer, always a treasurer. But having eliminated emissions from electricity in our jurisdiction through the purchase of 100% renewable electricity in a nation-leading reverse auction process over the last 10 years, I want to focus today on our approach to providing clear and early signals to business, to households and to the market on our pathway to reduce emissions from our two biggest remaining uh, emission producing sectors in our territory, transport and gas. So gas makes up about 20% uh, of Canberra's total emissions at this point with 100% renewable electricity. So when we released our climate change strategy in 2019, we committed to a multi-decade transition uh, to phase out gas by 2045, and that is in line with our jurisdictional target to achieve net zero emissions in that same year. Now, setting a target is one thing, getting there is another. And since setting that target, we've undertaken considerable economic modelling and analysis to understand what would be the best pathway, the best approach to phasing out gas. And just a few weeks ago, we released this modelling and announced that we would be pursuing an electrification pathway over the next two decades. Now, we've chosen this approach because the evidence is clear. Renewable electricity is the cheapest and cleanest way 
to power our homes and businesses in the ACT. But we also fully recognise that this transition cannot and will not happen overnight. 130,000 of the 190,000 households in the ACT currently have a gas connection. There are gas appliances and technologies where there simply isn't a cost-effective uh, option at this point or the technology doesn't exist to go electric at this point in time. So the best way I can equate our approach to phasing out gas is to equate it with the rollout of digital television uh, or the phase out of leaded petrol. We provide a clear signal now to enable as much of the transition cost to be met through business as usual purchases by households and businesses over a multi-decade period. So most Canberrans will make this transition over the next 20 years without the need for government support. In the same way that most households bought a digital TV when it suited them. But for those who do need assistance, we already have a program in place to assist households and businesses to meet some of the upfront costs. The Sustainable Household Scheme is an award-winning program that provides Canberra households and now community groups with zero interest loans to support the purchase of energy efficient products. And they're many and varied. Uh, efficient electric heating, efficient electric cooling, rooftop solar panels, household battery storage systems, induction cooktops, zero emission vehicles. All of them supported by this incredibly popular scheme. But by making our decision now and being very clear about our electrification pathway, we're providing the sort of certainty that the community needs to plan investments into the future. And that clear policy direction informs the development of an integrated energy plan for the ACT. The plan will consider in detail the energy needs for our territory as we phase out gas and embrace electric vehicles, both of which will see a significant energy mix shift and more need for more renewable energy. The question of how we meet increased demand for electricity in the most cost effective way will be central to this plan. A failure to plan for increased demand will lead to price shocks and reliability issues in our electricity system. This is one of the most common things raised with governments. Long-term planning, planning for the future and being clear about your policy direction. And so it is a great relief following the federal election in May that secure and reliable energy supply is now a priority for all levels of government in Australia. Now in the Territory we are leveraging the expertise of our world-class tertiary research institutes to support reliable energy storage solutions and to optimise our existing electricity network. To supplement this work, a major commitment of mine at our 2020 Territory election was the introduction of the big Canberra battery to provide at least 250 megawatts, although from market sounding, we're going to go much bigger than that, of new large-scale battery storage. This is a critical initiative to strengthen the stability of our energy grid, to foster further growth in the renewable energy sector in the Territory, and potentially, and again, here's the Treasurer speaking, providing a source of revenue for the Territory Government. The integrated energy plan will further consider the role of energy storage and distributed energy supply in our jurisdiction. Now turning now to transport, one of the most critical challenges in achieving our ambitious 2045 target is to reduce transport emissions. They are now our single largest source of emissions in the Territory. Now just prior to the announcement of our broader electrification pathway. Uh, the Minister for Energy and I released our ACT zero emissions vehicle strategy for the rest of this decade. Under the strategy, we aim to be the most attractive place to buy a zero emission vehicle, 
And we do this by having no stamp duty, by having two years of free registration and by providing interest-free loans of up to $15,000 for eligible vehicle purchases. We're supporting the rollout of a massively expanded public charging infrastructure network in the Territory, with a recent announcement of an additional 77 charging stations across the Territory, tripling the current public charging capacity. And just like our approach to electrification, this strategy sends a clear signal to the market. We've indicated, and this the way of the media was the thing that got the most attention, was that we will cease registering ICE vehicles, new ICE vehicles, after 2035. Now, California followed us a few days later. <laughs> the European Union were already there. But just like our approach to electrification, this strategy sends a clear long-term signal, a signal that we will make this shift gradually over time, that there is an identifiable time frame within a reasonable uh, distance from where we are now, and that we send the necessary signal to ensure that the transition cost of embracing zero emission vehicles will again largely be met largely, not exclusively, but largely be met by business as usual purchase decisions. The average Canberran uh, keeps a car for about seven years. Some a little longer, some a little shorter, depending on, uh, on their personal circumstances. But within the transition period, people will have multiple opportunities to make that shift. Uh, the data that's come out today uh, again demonstrates that in the Australian Capital Territory on a per capita basis, we are the fastest purchasers uh, of new zero emission vehicles. And frankly, at the moment, the challenge, someone's phone ringing, uh, the challenge is getting access to a vehicle. So part of my job, and I've been undertaking this uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, is beating a path to the door of every EV vehicle manufacturer that supplies the Australian market to get more vehicles into Canberra because we know they're going to sell. Now we also have an opportunity, and again with the change of federal government, to work across the Federation with a national electric vehicle strategy set to be delivered by the federal government. We expect to see national, state and territory policy settings working together now to increase both the supply and demand for electric vehicles. So indeed, complementary national and state and territory actions are going to be essential if we are going to pull together all of the good work that has been occurring around the Australian Federation, led in the last decade by the states and territories, but now with an opportunity to partner with the federal government to achieve our climate goals. The new federal government's com commitments on emissions reduction and climate action clearly demonstrate that after a wasted decade, we have entered a new era of collaboration and cooperation on climate change. We're already seeing what that means in practice. Energy ministers are finally meeting again. They've demonstrated a capacity to work together to solve both immediate and medium term challenges. Chris Bowen is the most enthused, engaged, intelligent uh, energy minister that we have had for 10 years, possibly in the history of the Federation. He won't mind me saying that. But it is just palpable the difference uh, that his stewardship of this portfolio has made already uh, just in several months. And so we're sending clear signals across the nation and in, and in each state and territory to households and businesses that vital decisive and meaningful national action is coming and it is central to ensuring market forces support the right investments over the next couple of decades. So we really look forward to working with the Commonwealth in all of these areas, but particularly as the national EV strategy and the safeguards mechanism take shape. 
Across Australian business and industry, they have been screaming out for a clear national policy direction on climate change for a decade now. This is the opportunity. This is the moment, everyone. The key measures that we need to put in place will be delivered in this term of parliament and the next. What I'm delighted about is that they are complementing the policy settings that we're leading at a territory level and we've been working collaboratively with uh, other sub-national governments to pursue, to drive the technological solutions and to increase the supply of cheap renewable energy to allow us to meet net zero on the timeframes that we know we need to. Now, I've spoken this morning about the importance of clear policy settings and the powerful role that market signals can play in melding a business as usual approach into our drive to transition to net zero. But we also know and recognise that this is a massive transition and that the policy settings need to combine with direct government investment and regulation in some areas. So at a territory level, for example, our home energy support program that was launched earlier this year is providing targeted support to improve the energy efficiency and thermal comfort of homes for our public housing tenants and our low income home owners. This initiative complements a range of existing programs aimed at supporting uh, vulnerable people to manage the transition to a net zero future. And that includes our low income utilities concessions and our free home energy assessments. It's important that this journey involves all of us and that is clearly a role for government at both state and territory and federal levels. But as we continue our journey to net zero, the ACT's focus will be on ensuring that the government investment to support the transition is targeted to people and groups in the community who really need that support. And that the measures that we, that we pursue deliver the greatest value for money in terms of emission reductions that can be achieved for that government spend. So this combination of clear policy signals and quality government investment and regulation will be the cornerstone of meeting net zero in a way that supports fairness in our community and economic prosperity for all. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words to open the forum this morning. I wish you all the best over the next couple of days. This event is a fantastic opportunity to bring leaders together, to learn from one another and to continue to drive a prosperous future that is a net zero future. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Minister. And it's absolutely palpable to see kind of how that kind of signalling to let people know that you know, we're on a clear path with good governance to a clean energy future, how strong it permeates throughout the community. My brother lives in Canberra. He often sends texts to the group chat showing us his solar panels, his, uh, his dashboard about how cheap his electricity is, and I just get a reply to him, big deal, mate. When I'm in a traffic jam in Sydney, I can see the harbour. And you know, it's just like... <laughs> It's just, you know, a different, different world. <laughs> All right. Well, now, while we're... Um, well, before we're about to unleash our uh, Unleashing Renewable Energy Storage panel, before we kick that off, please use the hashtag 2022 Better Futures Forum if you're online or you're posting about it. That way we can collect all these tweets and share them as they go. Now, we're about to be joined by five outstanding industry voices who will explore the positive role of energy storage and the need for policy settings to facilitate its rapid deployment to mitigate future energy price shocks. If you're online, please pop your questions into the question tab to the right of your screen and we'll get to them at the end of the session. And for folks in the room, as we do questions, if you could raise your hand, we'll rush a microphone out to you. Uh, try not to talk until we get the microphone to you so people online can have a chance to hear it. Um, so yeah, keep, keep that in mind at the end of the session. All right, let's get started with our first panel. John Grimes is the CEO of the Smart Energy Council, a bold advocate for the smart energy industry. He sits on a bunch of expert reference committees and boards and is regularly called upon 
by the media to provide and debunk whatever comes out of Andrew Bolt's mouth. Please welcome the legendary John Grimes. Well, I'm going to ask the panel to come and sit and we'll conduct it from down here. Fantastic. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, my name is John Grimes. I'm the Chief Executive of the Smart Energy Council. And I'd like to start by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Nungawal and Ngambri people, uh, and uh, particularly uh, pay tribute to their elders past, present and emerging. After 200 years of pushing a people down, I think it is our collective duty to take the young people, the emerging leaders, of that group and lift them up so that they, they take their rightful place as leaders of our entire society. Well, uh, today, the Smart Energy Council and Better Futures Forum are announcing the launch of our campaign to turbocharge investment in energy storage in our electricity grid. We're delighted to be working with Better Futures and this is going to be a very important campaign going forward. So, why are we doing it? Well, let me just set the scene a little bit. Um, first, the good news. Today, we're at over 30% renewables in our national grid. Not as good as the ACT at 100, but for the entire grid, that's a good start. And the federal government has a target of 82% renewables by 2030. Now, we need to go as fast as possible, uh, and, uh, but that's, again, that's a good start but you know, we need to keep the pressure on. Now, in this process, you heard the Chief Minister say, we're gonna take all of those emissions that are currently in petrol and diesel, and we're gonna transfer them onto the electricity grid. We're gonna take all of those emissions that are currently in gas for heating our homes and our water, for cooking, in industry, and we're gonna transfer them onto the electricity grid. So the electricity of the grid of the future is gonna be much bigger than the electricity grid today. And the good news is, overwhelmingly, it's going to be powered by renewable energy, zero carbon clean energy uh, generated here in Australia. Um, and, and so that means the energy experts, people at AEMO, are saying that by 2030, they expect up to 60% of the current coal generation to have exited the grid. And their forecast in the inter integrated system plan, Australia will be out of coal altogether by 2043. Not soon enough, but that's the projection. Right? Now, uh, renewables are fantastic, but they are variable. So it means that you've got to um, uh, fill those, those small holes. If you get solar and wind and put them on top of each other, actually, they perform pretty well. Solar in the daytime, wind predominantly at night, uh, and so there are only little areas that you've got to fill in, but you have to fill them in. Otherwise, the lights go out, our economy stops, and it's just not, not possible in an advanced economy to, to, to have those problems. So we also know that you can't turn off an old cold fire power station without building in advance, without putting the renewables and the storage in place so that when you turn off one system, the other system clicks on. And unfortunately, the market on its own is not gonna, it doesn't have a crystal ball, it's not gonna read the tea leaves to say, well, maybe in the future there'll be a need for this and it'll happen at some time, so I'm gonna make a multi-billion dollar investment in the energy storage system that we need today. That's not gonna happen, right? This needs to be a coordinated and planned process. Otherwise, the naysayers, right, who spit their insults at, at this industry are going to have a field day, right? And it's not good enough, actually, that the, the Australian people deserve better than that. So that's the context and the background for this really important discussion. How do you get the security, low prices, low emissions or no emissions, and actually power our economy into the future? That's really the challenge before us. So we've brought together an absolutely fantastic panel uh, and let me just uh, introduce them to you. So first is the ACT Chief Minister, Andrew Barr. 
Uh, we have Rick Brizali, the Managing Director. Uh, actually, let me go in, in order so that we, yeah, it makes more sense. Uh, second, L Lara Panchkoff, uh, who is the Growth and Market Development Manager at Fluence. Fluence is a big battery, one of the world's biggest um, battery integrators uh, uh, companies. Uh, we, we have uh, Luke Osborne, who's a partner at Stride Renewables. We have Dr. F Dr. Francis Veden, who's the founder and managing director at Vulcan Energy Resources. And last but not least, uh, Rick Brizali, who is the managing director at Green Energy Trading. And what I'd like to start by doing is just giving each panelist three or four minutes just to outline, this is the problem that we have. What, how do we plan this? How do you, how do you set a trajectory and how do you make that real? Uh, so, so good. Let, let's uh, let's begin, Rick, with you. Okay, thanks, <clears throat> thanks, John, and pleasure to be here. Um, probably a good place to start is to look at some of the policies uh, that we have rolled out to support um, uh, sort of renewable energy and and also storage. So, um, we can have grants and rebates, which has worked in um, say for storage, um, for battery storage in Victoria and South Australia a bit. Um, fits and starts. Uh, we have the New South Wales governments introducing a certificate-based scheme for behind the metre uh, battery storage, a uh, peak demand reduction scheme, which will include batteries. And then, and then you've got um, contracting. And, and again, the New South Wales government with their LTESA will be actually contracting for large-scale storage. So we've got three types of mechanisms that are uh, working at the moment. Um, and my colleague Tristan and I, we uh, put together a couple of thought pieces last year saying that we could use the renewable energy target infrastructure. Uh, it has been one of the most successful projects or programs that has driven um, probably the, the sort of the most meaningful emission reductions in Australia, probably the only one to tell you the truth, uh, and we could adapt that to also drive storage. Um, so there's a broad, there's a, there's a number of policies we could use, but we do need we, we think we really need to get on with it. We haven't got much time to waste. We're running out of gas. Um, we've got gas supply issues. Uh, we've got power price issues. We need to get moving fast. Fantastic. Dr. Beaton? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, yeah, a national target, a federal target, would, would, certainly, would certainly help. Um, I think there needs to be fair compensation for um, uh, people who are installing... Um, home batteries as well and feeding into the grid as well um, because I think you know the um, uh, the scale of, of uh, home solar is really incredible in, in Australia we need to take advantage of that I, I would um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to provide a slight word of caution as well though I think we we're operating under the premise that um, on the battery side um, battery costs are coming down every year they're not anymore so over the last 18 months for the first time um, battery costs went up um, and we need to do something about that because um, that's obviously making this less affordable um, for people who can least afford it. So um, that is driven by, the pack costs are driven by um, global competition for these batteries, which is in turn driven by global competition for the resources. So um, speaking as a, um, from the industry of renewable energy and um, raw materials, we, I think we need a national ambition to um, increase the um, uh, raw material resource production. Um, I'm talking from a lithium perspective, um, where prices are up ninefold over the last year. Um, this is now having a direct cost uh, it, um, effect on battery costs. So uh, we, we need, um, I think, uh, some, some federal ambition behind the raw materials production as well um, to, to help get those pack costs down. Imagine if we had a federal government that had a plan to value add our resources and not just put dirt on a ship and send it overseas. So you could actually, you could, you could do that processing here and then ultimately make the lithium ion batteries that the world needs and become a net exporter of a really high value product. Exactly right. So, I mean, what we're seeing is much more regionalization of the supply chain. So in the EU now, um, and this is spreading all over to North America, to Japan, China in particular, um, these trading blocks, these countries, um, want to build batteries domestically, and then they want to keep the raw materials um, domestically as well. So they want to restrict export of EVs, of batteries. Um, 
because they see this as a circular economy in the long term, so they want to keep these strategic raw materials. And that we were very good, obviously, at digging them up and exporting them, but we need to be cognizant of that, and we need to um, really try and keep this value out and keep these raw materials in country, and that will drive down storage costs. Fantastic. Thank you. Luke. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, ideally, uh, we wouldn't have to have government sort of involved in the market would deliver this, as you said, but it's just worth reflecting on why, we, why governments are a big part of our industry and why they're a big part of energy, and that's because it takes a while for you to get down the cost curve and batteries at the moment have a supply chain issue. They otherwise would be coming down the cost curve. Um, and if we just look at the history of Australia, you know, we've had, look, and I'll just take the ACT, you know, the ACT's been great at catalyzing uh, rooftop solar and getting that down the cost curve, where now it just makes sense to put it on without any subsidy. Same with wind, same with solar, and I really appreciate the fact that the ACT government was there in the dark days. You know, they were the buyer by the, the reverse auction process um, that kept our industry going during that time. If we now think, so, so that's the reason we need governments is getting there ahead of the market because the market is brutal. It will wait for prices to spike to a really horrible level and we know that the community and manufacturers just hate that. So we really need government involved and getting us through that period of getting the cost down to where the market just takes over. Um, and the way I see it is we've got three different scales operating here. So very large scale um, when we think about big batteries and big um, pumped hydros, those storage systems are pretty important and what the investors need there is certainty. Um, so we need policies that drive that certainty and allow them to make a very long-term, very large investment. Community scale, which has been a big plank of the, la the federal labor, labor's policy, that's just, that's about tariffs getting in the way. So it makes it very hard for communities to come together pull their investments and share because you get charged, uh, ch charged if you like, excuse the pun, of putting putting power in and pulling it back out. And so there's the, the, the grid, the way we do grid tariffs is a friction on making that shared investment possible. Uh, and if we get down to the small scale behind the meter residential stuff, it's really about the capital cost um, that, that the homeowner faces and, and a lot of what Andrew's putting in place here um, is about making that investment more palatable to households. So we have those three different scales and I think that's probably leading us to different policies to, to address those different scales. So I'll give you a go now, Lara, thank you. Great, thanks. So I, I think the group here has already touched on a lot of great points of scoping what the problem really is, identifying what policies, what uh, market drivers we already have, so then we can look at what gaps are left over. Um, I might just go into a little bit more detail on utility scale storage challenges because um, I guess I've been across small scale from residential virtual power plants in a previous life and now I'm very close to the decision makers for your utility scale battery storage projects. And I think Luke spelled out quite clearly that the difficult here in utility scale is making a long term uh, very uh, risk-averse financial decision where things like contracted revenue are almost required for almost every project. Um, it can make it very hard in the current NEM market context um, to get enough certainty that you'll be able to recoup enough revenue to make an investment worthwhile. So most projects that have gone ahead in large-scale storage have had either arena funding, uh, state government-backed contracts such as for the Victorian big battery network service contract um, or have been supported by government. There are several projects that have managed to get their business case over the line as a merchant project. However, this is extremely rare. It's going to happen. However, it's probably not going to happen at the right rate that we need with the level investment that's needed and also potentially faster coal plant retirements. I think you mentioned AMO thinks uh, coal plants could all retire by 2043, uh, but this, this could happen even faster. I mean, the hydrogen superpower scenario says, I think 2032, and that's all of our coal um, plant capacity gone. So going back to the biggest challenges, I see investment case and also grid connection. Um, so I think we need to look at 
what policy gap remains that needs to be filled in this near to midterm um, that is the appropriate role of, of the Commonwealth to fill. Um, and maybe one last point before we get into a deeper discussion. I think that role is really emissions reduction policy. So we, we have our 43% emissions reduction by 2030 um, already legislated. We are hopefully going to put an environmental objective into the, um, into the near, into the um, national electricity objective. But it's really about how do we actually get there with what mechanisms. And I see storage, it's not a generator, it's more of an enabler of renewables. It's this key role to play that can uh, play a strong role as an emissions reduction policy, or one of many emissions reduction policies. I might stop there. I think we can get more detailed discussion, but that's an overview of how I'm seeing things. Right, fantastic. Chief Minister. I appreciate all that has been said. One thing that hasn't been touched on that, that particularly state and territory governments are grappling with is our role beyond the regulatory regimes uh, and de-risking private investments. We, as a territory government, own half of, only half, because half was privatised, but we own half of the distribution network in this territory. We own an energy retailer. So, as a proud social democrat, I'm not going to stand by and allow the pathway to net zero emissions be a pathway to smaller government and privatisation unnecessarily. So I think there is a broader question around role of government and whether we are asset owners in the large storage space and that we will generate an income. Other state governments own the coal-fired power generators. They own the legacy assets. So the question for them will be, will they step in and own on behalf of their communities to generate revenue for their state budgets, which, let me tell you, in Australia, we have a revenue problem. We have a labour social spending base, NDIS and a range of other things, and we have a liberal tax base, and the gap is a massive deficit. And so we have to generate more revenue. And so one of the live questions for state and territory governments is do we have a role to play here? Our cost of capital is going to be lower. If we're already de-risking, then why wouldn't we play a role? But we've got, obviously, to contemplate you know, the scarce capital and investment that we have. But I don't see any problem. That's one of the streams of our big Canberra battery. I touched on it in my opening remarks, that we will generate that revenue and put it back into the Territory budget in order to finance other worthy investments, both in climate action and otherwise. So that's one public, public policy question that we are grappling with. What is the role for government? Uh, and then I think there is a live question about, uh, you know, and across the different streams uh, of investment that we've, uh, we, we've heard from the other panellists around large scale, community scale and household level. Back to that proposition I put in my opening remarks about value for money and prioritising emission reduction first, but we do want everyone to play a role, so there is a degree of subsidisation that will go on. The one thing that we are investing in, particularly in terms of the research and development I touched on, is vehicle to grid. The biggest battery that a household is likely to have is going to be in their car, 70-odd you know, kilowatts or more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a, a home battery, a power wall is, what, five or ten? Yeah, 13, yeah. So your car battery is going to be five times bigger. So that might be the most efficient way to support at a household level is utilising your vehicle battery. But obviously we've got a lot of work to do uh, on the vehicle to grid uh, uh, interaction question. Uh, Francis, in, in, in what you're talking about, you're talking about the price of lithium-ion batteries. And the price for stationary batteries, a solar battery, is about $1,000 per kilowatt hour of, of capacity, or kilowatt of capacity. So um, uh, in, in electric vehicles, though, it's only a fraction of that. And I think people have done the calculation that if you bought, bought, bought an electric vehicle for the battery, you actually get a free car thrown in. <laughs> do, do you have any uh, comment on that? I wasn't aware of that, actually. Um, uh, my 
uh, sort of Intel, if you like, is just on uh, lithium-ion battery pack price, and um, you know we see this steady progression down to where it is now, which is sort of a hundred, around about a hundred dollars per per kilowatt hour. Um, I wasn't aware there was a differentiation with home storage batteries because I mean, uh, most I think it's the same technology, right? It's lithium lithium-ion, but um, th there shouldn't be a differentiation. Um, but interestingly, I mean. Um, the two sectors, so eventually, as um, has been pointed out, you know, the home storage batteries eventually may become less relevant over time as EV adoption takes off. But um, currently, they're, they're competing for the same, um, uh, the same battery packs, same battery cells, and the same resources. And um, electric vehicle companies are competing with each other. Um, and it's not just a short-term um, you know, COVID-induced supply chain issue. This is really a structural um, shortage. Um, so there's... A lot of great targets being set around the world, and they are necessary. Um, but um, we, we need um, a lot more work to uh, to increase our production of those batteries. Ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that this is an interactive session. So we're going to come and actually call on the audience for some questions shortly. And those watching at home, we have the technology. So there's actually, your questions will show up here on my knee. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so start thinking about those. There are three things I want to cover off quickly before we do pass to the audience and really try and capture some of those questions in the room and online, um, for just three quick things. One is, you know, what, what do we need to, to do to get large scale right? How do we do small scale? And then non-battery technologies, thinking about the other technologies. So they're the three things I want to touch on. So let's touch on the first of those first. It seems to me that much of the getting the rules of the road right for large scale storage is not about actually tapping into a big amounts of taxpayer funds or um, increasing people's electricity bills, but rather it's about giving investors certainty with their private capital to make it a private investment to, and then be, be sure of a return. Does anyone, Lara, did you want to make a comment yeah. on that? Yeah, great. So, so yes, I'm relatively close to, to many, I guess, um, investors and developers' business cases, and you're exactly right. I think the challenge here is that there are several quite, there are many quite robust business cases for projects that are just about to go ahead. However, there's a slight, uh, I guess you'd call it a missing money gap here that the NEM is not currently providing, or the national electricity market isn't providing enough certainty. Um, so really it's closing this small, small investment certainty gap and, and you can let private capital do the rest. Um, there's probably, I think, four main mechanisms that that could help here. I won't go into detail of all of them, but I'll just touch on what Andrew just referenced, which was state and territory governments playing a role in de-risking revenue just, just a little bit. <coughs> so things like um, making sure there's at least perhaps a floor on revenue that might be set extremely low so that if there's a, a, a difficult year, perhaps that asset can be topped up ever so slightly. However, there's also all sorts of things we can do with making sure that if that asset earns perhaps performs extremely well, state and territory governments can also get the benefits of that. Therefore, consumers yeah. get the benefits of that. So we, I, I'm extremely uh, supportive of structures like this. I think the challenge with them, though, is they generally work best on a state or territory level with um, different levels of procurements. So I think we should also be looking to what other policy mechanisms we, we can um, deploy. That's where likely a storage target could come in. So a certificate mechanism, which we can talk about in a little bit more detail. And the way that would work for utility scale projects is if retailers need to procure <coughs> sorry, a certain amount of certificates, that means that these projects can obtain contracts with a little bit of de-risked revenue in the long term. Um, I can go into more here. I might just stop there for a second and let the others comment. Yeah. Anybody else want to make a comment on that? Large scale, getting large scale over the line? All, all, all I'll say is that the, the model that Lara's referred to is effectively the contract for difference model that we deployed for our large scale renewable energy contracts. So effectively hedging at a fixed price, we went to the market, they bid the lowest price that they possibly could, guaranteed. If the, the market price surges well above uh, and they make a super profit, then that is returned to the territory. 
uh, in other instances, in the circumstances where you know, there's a collapse uh, in, the, in the market price uh, and the, you know, the, the value uh, to the generator is considerably less, then there are top-up payments. Now, our experience so far, perhaps helped by the volatility of the national market because of the absence of federal policy direction, uh, has been that that contract for difference has actually worked uh, very much in the, uh, to the advantage of the Territory Government and, uh, and consumers in the ACT because we've uh, generally had uh, periods of price reduction because we've, we've got very good long-term renewable energy contracts. My lived example for you all in this financial year is that electricity prices are falling in the ACT when they are going up by 20% uh, in other parts of the country. Here, here, that's it's a wonderful result for the people of the ACT, for, I think, for, for uh, reaping the rewards of, of standing by the industry in, in those dark times I referenced. Um, I'll, uh, one of the interesting things about batteries is a very, um, they're a very useful element in the electricity grid, so they can do a lot of different things. So the, the obvious one is is just moving energy between, say, the middle of the day and the and the evening peaks. But they also uh, can jump in very quickly in, in what we call the ancillary markets or reserve markets, so they can stand there ready to, to just keep the, the system balanced at very short notice. Uh, and they can also do some very interesting things for our transmission system, so they can act as virtual transmission and unload a congested grid um, which is very useful because it means we don't have to rip up roads or build big transmission lines um, as much. Um, so when we support big storage, we just got to make sure that we give uh, the owners of those big storage systems the incentive to chase all those revenues because they're really useful things to chase. Um, they'll make our system a renewable grid possible. So we just need to think about making sure that we don't destroy the incentives to optimise your, what we call the value stack, and make sure you chase every little bit of value you can for your, for your, your big investment. Moving on to the next, next item, which is small scale. Uh, and let me just uh, perhaps paint a picture first. So we, we have a member company, and they do managed EV charging. That means when you plug your, your EV in, it doesn't charge automatically. It just sits there and a third party looks at the market and says, actually, we've got heaps of solar energy right now, prices are really low, let's charge your electric vehicle now. Or let's charge at 3am when otherwise the electricity is, is not going to be used. And effectively what they're doing is they're providing very, very cheap and in some cases free charging for electric vehicles. If we can do that in the middle of the day, free vehicles running on Australian sunshine, it's like that's where we want to be, right? Now, the opposite is also true. There are some vehicles that allow what's called vehicle to grid. And so you can have your car plugged in and a third party can say, the grid's under enormous stress right now. It's eight o'clock at night uh, and everybody's got their appliances on and you charged your vehicle at two in the afternoon, we gave you that almost free solar energy we'd love some of it back right now because that would be a big help to the entire community. So that managed EV charging. But it, it shows a dilemma because people make a private investment in their car or in their home battery. How do we put the incentives in place so people actually want to participate in, in outcomes like that? So there's a private benefit because it's my car or my battery, but there's a community benefit because actually I can help all of my neighbours and my community as well. Anybody who wants to take it? Rick. Well, I'll have a go. John, um, I think one of the challenges we've got at the moment is um, uh, the national electricity market, um, focusing on, on the eastern states, just doesn't really allow for anyone other than retailers to come in and provide a ser uh, services. Um, and we were meant to have this thing called, called the Wholesale Demand Response Mechanism. Uh, it's uh, AMO and the AMC did roll that out, um, has been ineffective uh, to date but most, they've excluded um, the residential sector. So we, at the moment, we have to wait until well after 2025 to see what this post-NEM looks like. Um, but I would come back to um, maybe one of the points you raised before, that this is essentially a climate policy. Uh, so we're dealing with a, an externality that we need to price. We know that the value of emissions is going to in, is continue to increase, um, and so, 
government putting in place a framework um, to basically help roll out storage with new renewables. So uh, we see a, a, quite a link, new renewables with storage and then contracting that together is probably the way, the way to go. But I think your scenario that, that you talked about, I think we have to wait until post-2025 and hopefully the NEM arrangements will, will be freed up so we'll allow a whole lot more innovative, innovative participants in the market. I was just going to say, you put a pricing signal in place, yes. you have a smartphone app and you wait to see how many households become energy traders. <laughs> no, it'll happen. There'll, there will be people who make a living out of it, I reckon, who will uh, generate as much energy as they can and then sell it back at, uh, at, at peak times. Um, you know, as long as it's opt-in it's opt and we've got the, the smart metering technology uh, and it's made simple for households, I think it will take off. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one para great paradigm, I think, is where we, we invite everybody to participate and give them the right signals and reward them for doing so, so putting their, risking their capital and putting it in there. The other paradigm is we just simply re review household energy resources or distributed energy resources, as we call them, uh, like solar, like batteries and like smart cars as something to be managed um, and curtailed and, and, and controlled and that's the paradigm that's actually winning in most jurisdictions, actually. So, so I think it really does take that sort of elevated, that high road of, of saying, no, that people, everybody can be a participant um, and, and we need government to make that happen. Otherwise, networks predominantly will step in and, and manage it and treat it as a problem rather than an opportunity. The final thing that I wanted to raise before passing to the audience is, is this question of not just batteries, right? Lithium-ion batteries are helpful, but it's not just batteries, right? It's pumped hydro storage. It's thermal heat from solar thermal plants. So you might be storing heat in big salt blocks or in you know, molten salt, for example, and other things. So really keen to, to get the, the view of the panel, you know, what, what degree do you think these other technologies will play a, a role in the, in the energy system? For, for storage. Lara? Uh, yeah. Yes, sure, I'll, I'll go yeah. first. I mean, these other technologies absolutely have a role to play and, and we know uh, established technologies like pumped hydro, for example, are the best, um, best solution for longer duration storage um, at the moment. So we, we are going to deal with very long duration, sorry, uh, instances where there are renewable droughts for you know several weeks or seasons, that, that's definitely um, something that pumped hydro could address. When we do look at new technologies, I, I want to uh, look at this in the frame of should a, a storage target or a policy in the near to mid term uh, support this? I mean, this, this we would have to debate quite a lot and think about what is the outcome of this policy? Is it for rapid emissions reductions over the next 10 to 15 years? Um, in which case we should set a policy that puts technologies on it. I guess an even playing field to so the best technology would, would win. We don't want to play the role of, uh, we'll pick uh, solar thermal to incentivize that. I think that's more of the role of someone like Arena to help technologies like that catch up. Um, the other comment I would make is that, um, so we've been doing, I guess, lithium ion battery storage for I think over 14 years now. So we've seen it from uh, the very first commercial scale plant connected into the Indiana grid to demonstrate frequency control and we've seen a lot of technological development along the way. However, it is a little slow to reach commercialization and mass scale than expected, even with a lot of investment. So we'll just have to make sure that, you know, if we encourage different technologies, um, not all technologies will make it through. We have a lot of good established technologies and probably a few um, of these new ones will, will catch up, perhaps via arena funding. Um, but we just wanna be cautious on what outcome do we want? If this is a mission reduction policy, what do we want it to do? Yeah, there's a there's a number of pumped hydros in the system, and Snowy Two is the the the, um, the most well known. But the Central West pumped hydro, Oven Mountain, um, several others in New South Wales, um, they tend to be um, very good at that long duration role. So each additional hour of storage tends to be much much cheaper with a pumped hydro than than lithium ion, which doesn't scale as well. So each hour is quite expensive in lithium-ion batteries. Um, so we will see those and they require a lot of support 
also in the planning process as well as the construction process because they're very long and expensive to go through the planning. Each one's quite bespoke. They've got their own geology, their own community problems, all, all sorts of issues that need to be worked through. So, um, and we are seeing the New South Wales government support both ends of that, um, both the development and the construction. Um, so that's that's that. And getting away from so. Um, if Francis might disagree with me here, but but lithium iron was a technology, really, it's 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 a very lovely mobile technology, and it was really developed for that purpose. So it's lightweight, um, it's a lightweight battery, and it's great for m mobile ap applications. And sometimes it feels to me that's a bit of a pity uh, that we're parking it um, in one spot. Um, and there are other technologies, so there's flow batteries and various other types of batteries that are heavier, less applicable to mobile applications that we could use, but they're much less down the cost curve. Uh, they haven't been as well supported. And you know what we find is you've got to build a lot of something to get it reliable, de-risk, cheap enough, um, that we just haven't done that yet. So there are other storage technologies in the pipeline, and I'd love to see, see those supported and brought down that. That, that learning curve, for instance. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think we need to fund other battery technologies um, as well. Um, you know, things like flow batteries, etc. It seems to be that lithium ion is just um, is just is just really becoming the sole technology um, in both the transportation and the social storage sector. So I, I definitely think we should fund other battery technologies as well. Um, interestingly, for pumped hydro, I mean, um, uh, something that's happened. Um, in Australia once recently is the use of old um, mining pits um, you know, where the hole is already dug so that I think incentivizing miners once the, you reach end of life to use those pits as pumped hydro would be um, something that we should encourage as well. Absolutely. Uh, if I could John, um, I was, um, uh, you piqued my interest when talking about um, solar thermal and we actually forget that we've got a, a technology available right now that's solar thermal, um, which is air source heat pumps and, and solar hot water that could that has a really important application to particularly get us off gas. So you know, imagine if we could displace displacing gas gas use, and then um, sort of using your solar in the middle of the day to heat your water. That creates a solar uh, a solar sponge. Um, and it also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that's probably one of the most compelling um, uh, uh, activities that we should start to roll out um, right now. Here, here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now to you. As Dan said earlier, we do have a microphone, so please wait for the microphone to come until, and just in the front row here, and then I'll come to you next, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Louise Fitzgerald from the International Universities Climate Alliance. Um, it, it's very, very impressive what you're doing. And I want to thank all of you for the dedication that you show to the transition from fossil fuels. Um, I uh, want to actually throw a really curly question to you, and it's about overall energy consumption. Because I think that um, whilst transitioning to renewable sources is a really important part of the solution, it seems to me that we've got the problem of increasing energy consumption, and that's really a huge problem because, as you're pointing out, we don't have, you know, meeting the need with uh, for, for renewable sources is, is enormous. So what do you actually think about energy consumption? Do you think it's a problem, and what do you think we can do about it? Energy efficiency, great question. <laughs> Anybody want to take that? Well, I think you're only partly right. Um, so, so you're dead right when we have a shortage of renewables, we have to be super uh, efficient at using it. Um, but we're, going to, we're entering a period of um, partial abundance. So we're going to have a lot of excess renewable energy, and we already have it at times, um, where it, it's quite important to, um, during those times, to actually use energy, and if we can use it productively, so we get industry ramping up during those periods. Um, and ramping back down when we've, we've got a shortage. So I think it's really about reversing the paradigm where the consumer now has to stay in sync with the generators. We, before we, we just, well today even, we, we just use energy when we feel like it and the generators follow us. We, we're really gonna start to flip that paradigm around and be conscious of 
right, today's a sunny day and we have an excess, let's use it now. Uh, I was going to make uh, just a couple of points. Um, uh, it's not just about um, electricity generation, because don't forget we've got to transport the electricity uh, through poles and wires. So there's a significant um, economic benefit in actually reducing um, electricity consumption. And we have a number of state-based energy saving schemes, including one in the ACT that's actually doing that. I see the challenge is actually to drive um, consum electricity consumption reduction, uh, in particularly between the period uh, 5 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night. That's really important. And probably the other en energy consumption problem is getting off gas, and actually gas efficiency and then electrification. And I think we, I see us quickly changing our focus to peak demand and getting rid of gas. They're probably the two key things. Look, I, I just observed there's a couple of competing trends. There's, I think, generally speaking, as technology evolves, it's becoming more energy efficient, but then there are more devices and there are more of us. So on a per cap, I guess the question is, is this on a per capita basis uh, or society as a, or a community as a whole? Because we can reduce our energy consumption per capita, but if our population is growing, then our total energy need will increase. And then there's the question of the, the shift, as has been touched on, the shift between energy sources. So in the ACT, our electricity consumption is going to increase massively, but our gas consumption falls falls to zero. But I think there is a role on the demand side uh, in terms of mitigation of, uh, of excess demand. Part of that is technology evolution, but I think we are in the world of the internet of everything and the electrification of everything. And I suspect the sum total of those trends is slightly more energy consumption. I might just make a, a few other comments, perhaps echoing Luke's comments of I think we're moving towards a situation of abundance and I mean the the great thing about renewables particularly wind and solar is that it's their near zero marginal cost so each additional megawatt um, uh, once you've sort of spent quite a bit of money on the capex is is near free so it's not really going to turn into how much and and reducing um, the amount of electricity we use but it's just going to turn into when and how do we cost effectively shift around either that electricity itself or consumer behaviour or commercial industrial behaviour, um, that would be the new emphasis and I guess that's why we're all talking about unleashing energy storage today. Um, it's a complete paradigm shift to I think what we were used to growing up of save electricity, doesn't matter what time of the day. So I just want to emphasise that I think that's a, that's a great point. Let's keep moving with the next question here. Well, somewhat ironically, my question was almost the same as the last one, but I, and I've heard what the panel has said, but um, I was going to cite um, Mark Diesendorf's paper uh, where he got some articles surrounding it about a week ago from the University of New South Wales saying that um, that we do have to, there, there isn't enough energy to go around um, and that we do have to reduce energy. We just simply, there's not enough energy um, potentially, if, even if, if we move to renewables. Um, I mean, I assume you're disputing what he's arguing, but anyway, it's, it's a respectable paper. Uh, the other person I would like to cite is Matt Musalek, who's an um, energy expert in Sydney, and he's... Um, constantly arguing that we have to stop building high-rise because we're not going to have enough energy for the lifts. Um, and um, so, I, I'm sorry, mine's more of a statement, but I just probably want to dispute what I, you all I think said. We're, say, we're saying that there will be enough energy for the lifts as long as you only ride them in the middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah that's, that's right. We might have a look over here. I think there's a gentleman just here in the middle. Then I'll come back to you at the front. Yep. Just up here in the middle. Yep. So it's on. Thank you, everyone. It's been a gr really great discussion. Um, my question is about community-owned batteries, given that they're a decentralised energy source and they essentially almost de-risk based on the number of users. And I was just wondering, in your opinion, what is the viability of those towards achieving emission reductions 
and improving renewable energy storage in our communities. I didn't quite get the first part of that. Sorry. Um, community I, batteries. Community yeah, oh, so okay. it's a question yeah. about yeah, community batteries and the viability of those. Well, you know, I'll be blunt, I suppose, is they're not viable, and that's because of the, um, the way that the networks charge for using their network. Um, and until we get what's called a local use of system charge, which makes it free to transport energy between your home and that shared resource, um, they're going to stay non-viable. So, um, you know, we really need that change in the way that tariffs are charged. I note that Evo here is probably the, the, the leader in, in talking about removing some of those charges. Um, but that really has to happen or it, th that isn't going to be the place we put storage. Um, um, and then quite apart from that, there's a sort of bit of tech that goes on top to make it sort of... Um, you know, understandable by the users, and um, I think that bit's doable. You know, we've got the technology to do that through the Internet of Things. Folks, we're starting to get the wind up, but we do have time for one final question over here. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Managuwu, uh, Dr. Virginia Marshall from the ANU and the Indigenous Peoples Organisation. Uh, thank you very much for what you've been talking about, but its application and practical outcomes for Aboriginal. Uh, and Torres Strait Islander communities, please. I think that indigenous content and making sure that we bring First Nations people in this in this energy transition is absolutely critical, um, and we need to design an inclusive and uh, and, and participatory. You know, we, we can't just change the old for the for, for a, a like kind of a incrementally better version of the new, right? We've got to actually think about this, Chief Minister. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, look, across the programs that, that we are running, it is both a climate reduction, uh, an emissions reduction agenda, but also an economic development agenda. And so I see considerable opportunity in the ACT as a centre for research and development and hopefully then commercialisation. Uh, and there are opportunities uh, for First Nations people in, uh, in that pipeline of uh, product development, commercialisation, research and development at a university and TAFE level. We're also then looking in terms of the transition from a household perspective, as I, you may not have been here for my opening remarks, but we have a particular program um, that, is, uh, that is supporting uh, vulnerable households as well. So there's a, both an economic participation question, a just transition question, uh, and then, I, I think as, as we've heard from some of the panellists, uh, some significant opportunities within the ACT context uh, in our uh, research institutions. And I guess the one takeout for me out of all of this is that there's uh, a range of new technologies that uh, we could potentially be doing more with. And as one in six Canberrans, including a considerable number of First Nations people are involved in our university sector, there is a particular opportunity in the ACT. Ladies and gentlemen, it was our collective political pressure that shifted the dial on the renewables question nationally. The new frontier for all of us is to swing in that political pressure behind getting energy storage right. Energy storage is the foundation that will make this transition possible. So we need to harness your voices. Be loud, be active, be educated, be part of this debate. Please join me in thanking our absolutely fantastic panel Rick Brazali, uh, uh, Dr Francis Verdon, uh, Luke Osborne, Lara Pankoff and uh, the Chief Minister Andrew Barr. Thank you, John. I can't wait to see uh, the Smart Energy Council's bin stickers. It'll turn your bin into a battery. Uh, that's exciting. Looking forward to that. Please thank our guests again. That was great. Now, the Better Futures Forum is privileged to have Auntie Dr Matilda House to give us a welcome to country. Auntie Dr Matilda House is a proud Nambri elder who has taken a leading edu role educating and advocating First Nations people and her country. Uh, in 2017, the Australian National University presented her with an honorary doctorate deg degree acknowledging her significant contribution to social, social justice, in particular her important role in key social justice organisations including the Aboriginal Ten Embassy and the establishment of the Aboriginal Legal Service in Queanbeyan in the 
80s and as a member of the Aboriginal Justice Advisory Committee. Auntie Matilda in 2006 was Canberra Citizen of the Year and on the eve of the National Apology to the Stolen Generations in February 2008, Auntie Matilda became the first person to perform the Welcome to Country at the opening of Federal Parliament. Please give it up for Auntie Dr Matilda. Thank you very much. I much appreciated. Uh, sorry, look, I want to apologise for being late, but I was with um, some people who've got a few problems around Australia concerning um, their health and well-being, and so uh, I was over there having a yarn up with Nacho. Um, but you know, even things like this affects affects everybody through the nation. I keep reminding people, you know, the parliamentarians all over, no matter where they come from, we don't live in trick and treat, you know. And I, uh, and I believe that everyone is doing their best just by listening and, and um, knowing the concerns that were said. And we are going to get there. We do have a future. I say that to my great-grandchildren, you know, the eldest is 11. And I say to him, Michael, I said, everything's going to be right. Nanny's going tomorrow to talk to some people about renewable energy. He said, um, he said I think I know about that, Nan. And I said, dear, yeah, well, come on, tell me what's it all about. <laughs> so I can pass it on. <laughs> And, and the best thing about it is that um, children at that age are still got so much up here. They want to learn. They, they are the uh, your renewable energy coming up, OK? They are. My great-grandchildren, you know, love school, love to do their things. And so does the elder ones the grandchildren. So everybody is going to support anything that is going to make a better future, a better future. And that's what we're all here today for. And I want to say thank you for having me here today. And I do apologise, but I always make sure that if someone wants to stop for a yarn, I do. And uh, that's, what, that's what my life's all about. You know, and I do appreciate everybody that uh, was here today and listening. I thought the panel, you know, um, they weren't struggling, but they were doing a good job. And, uh, and, uh, and I felt, yeah, I thought a little bit more questions would have been done, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there's another time. It's just like everything else around us. There's always another time. That's what my mum used to say. Don't worry about it. She said, it's another time. And um, so how great it is to live in a beautiful country like Australia and how great it is to know that people like yourselves are here, right around Australia, who want to look after and care, care for country, care, f care for the, uh, you know, our energy that we need. Let's look after what we have and we can make a better future for everybody. So thank you very much for having me in today. Mara, mara, ma, mara. That means creating pathways in the language. And the other one is, okay, I think I'm getting too old now. <laughs> but anyways, it's called respect. That's the one. And I respect each and every one of you that are here today for coming here and looking to care and to have a better future for country all around us. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Auntie Dr Matilda. Now, we've got a short break, 15 to 20 minutes, to entice you back here at 10.50. Make sure you hear the 
incredible Nadalia Barker is going to be performing for us. If you were on the forum stream last year, you would have seen her perform. She's absolutely awesome. So please get here at 10 minutes to 11 to see that performance. We'll see you then. Thanks, everyone.